Section 5 of Astounding Stories 12, December 1930. The Pirate Planet by Charles W. Diffin. Part B. Chapter 9. They were in a cabin at the very nose of the ship, seated on metal chairs, their hands unshackled and free. Their scarlet guardian reclined at ease somewhat to one side, but despite his apparent disregard, his cold eyes seldom left the faces of the two men. Windows closed them in, windows on each side, in front, above them, and even in the floor beneath. It was a room for observation whose metal latticed walls served only as a framework for the glass, and there was much to be observed. The golden radiance of sunlit clouds was warm above. They rose toward it, until high over the building's tallest spires there spread on every hand the bewildering beauty of that forest of minarets and sloping roofs and towers, whose many facets made glorious blendings of soft color. Aircraft at many levels swept in uniform directions throughout the sky. The ship they were in hung quiet for a time then rose to a higher level to join the current of transportation that flowed into the south. "'We will call it south,' said Professor Sykes. "'The sun-glow, you will observe, is not directly overhead. The sun is sinking. It is past their noon. What is the length of their day? Ah, this is interesting, interesting. The certain fate they had foreseen was forgotten. It is not often given to an astronomer to check at first hand his own indefinite observations. Look! McGuire exclaimed. Open country! The city is ending! Ahead and below them the buildings were smaller and scattered. Their new master was watching with closest scrutiny the excitement of the men. He whispered an order into a nearby tube, and the ship slowly slanted toward the ground. He was studying these new specimens, as McGuire observed, but the lieutenant paid little attention. His eyes were too thoroughly occupied in resolving into recognizable units the picture that flowed past them so quickly. He was accustomed, this pilot of the Army Air Service, to reading clearly the map that spreads beneath a plane, but now he was looking at an unfamiliar chart. "'Fields,' he said, and pointed to squared areas of pale reds and blues. "'Though what it is, heaven knows. And the trees, if that's what they are.' The ship went downward, where an area of tropical denseness made a tangled mass of color and shadow. "'Trees!' Lieutenant McGuire had exclaimed. But these forests were of tree forms in weirdest shapes and hues. They grew to towering heights, and their branches and leaves that swayed and dipped in the slow-moving air were of delicate pastel shades. "'No sunlight,' said the professor excitedly. "'They have no direct rays of the sun.' The clouds act as a screen and filter out actinic rays. McGuire did not reply. He was watching the countless dots of color that were people. People who swarmed here as they had in the city. People working at these great groves, crouching lower in the fields as the ship swept close. People everywhere in teeming thousands, and like the vegetation about them they too were tall and thin, attenuated of form, and with skin like blood-stained ash. They need the sun, Sykes was repeating, both vegetable and animal life. The plants are deficient in chlorophyll. See the pale green of the leaves. And the people need vitamins. Yet they evidently have electric power in abundance. I could tell them of lamps. His comments ceased, as McGuire lurched heavily against him. The flyer had taken note of the tense, attentive attitude of the one in scarlet. The man was leaning forward, his eyes focused directly upon the scientist's face. He seemed absorbing both words and emotions. How much could he comprehend? What power had he to vision the idea pictures in the other's mind? McGuire could not know. But, sorry, he told Sykes, that was clumsy of me. And he added in a whisper, Keep your thoughts to yourself. I think this bird is getting them. Buildings flashed under them, not massed solidly as in the city, yet spaced close to one another, as if every foot of ground not devoted to their incredible agriculture were needed to house the inhabitants. The ground about them was alive with an equally incredible humanity that swarmed over all this world in appalling profusion. Their horrid flesh, their hideous features, and their number, McGuire had a sudden sickening thought. They were larvae these crawling hordes, vile worm-things that infested a beautiful world, that bred here in millions, their numbers limited only by the space for their bodies and the food for their stomachs, 
And he, McGuire, a man, he and this other man with his clear-thinking scientific brain, were prisoners to this horde, captives to be used or butchered by those vile, crawling things. And again it was this world of contrast that drove home the conviction with its sickening certainty. A world of beauty, of delicate colors, of sweeping oceans and gleaming shores, and towering cities with their grace and beauty and elfin splendor, yet a world that shuddered beneath this devouring plague of grub-like men. They swept past cities and towns and over many miles of open land, before their craft swung eastward toward the dark horizon. The master gave another order into the speaking-tube, and their ship shot forward, faster and yet faster, with a speed that pressed them heavily into their seats. Behind them was the glory of the sunlit clouds, ahead the gloomy gray-black masses that must make a Stygian night sky over this lonely world, a world cut off by that vaporous shell from all communion with the stars. They were over the water, before them a dark ocean reached out in forbidding emptiness to a darker horizon. Ahead, the only broken line in the vast, level expanse, was a mountain rising abruptly from the sea. It was a volcanic cone surmounting an island. The sunlight's glow reflected from behind them against the somber mass that lifted toward the clouds. Their ship was high enough to clear it, but instead it swung as McGuire watched toward the south. The island drifted past, and again they were on their course. But to the flyer there were significant facts that could not pass unobserved. Their own ship had swung in a great circle to avoid this mountain, and all through the skies were others that did the same. The air above and about the grim sentinel peak was devoid of flying shapes. McGuire caught the eyes of the counselor, their keeper. "'What is that?' he asked, though he knew the words were lost on the other. He nodded his head toward the distant peak, and his question was plainly in regard to the island, and for the first time since their coming to this wild world, he saw, flashing across the features of one of these men, a trace of emotion that could only be construed as fear. The slitted eyes lost their look of complacent superiority. They widened involuntarily, and the face was drained of its blotched color. There was fear, terror unmistakable, though it showed but for an instant. He had control of his features almost at once, but the flyer had read their story. Here was something that gave pause to this race of conquering vermin. A place in the expanse of this vast sea that brought panic to their hearts. And there came to him, as he stowed the remembrance away in his mind, the first glow of hope. These things could fear a mountain. It might be that they could be brought to fear a man. The sky was clearing rapidly of traffic, and the mountain of his speculations was lost astern, when another island came slanting swiftly up to meet them as their ship swept down from the heights. It was a tiny speck in the ocean's expanse, a speck that resolved itself into the squared fields of colored growth, orchards whose brilliant strange fruits glowed crimson in the last light of day, and enormous trees beyond which appeared a house. A palace, McGuire concluded when he saw clearly the many-storied pile. Like the buildings they had seen, this also constructed of opalescent quartz. There were windows that glowed warmly in the dusk. A sudden wave of loneliness, almost unbearable, swept over the man. Windows and gleaming lights, the good sounds of earth, home, and his ears as he stepped out into the cool air were assailed with the strange cackle and calling of weird folk. The air brought him scents from the open ground beyond of fruits and vegetation like none he had ever known, and the earth, the homeland of his vain imaginings, was millions of empty miles away. The leader stopped, and McGuire looked dispiritedly at the unfamiliar landscape under dusky lowering skies. Trees towered high in the air, trees grotesque and weird by all earth's standards, whose limbs were pale green shadows in the last light of day. The foliage, too, seemed bleached and drained of color, but among the leaves were flashes of brilliance where night-blooming flowers burst open like star-shells to fill the air with heavy scents. Between the men and the forest growth was a row of denser vegetation, great ferns twenty feet and more in height, and among them at regular intervals stood plants of another growth, each a tremendous pod held in air on a thick stalk. Tendrils coiled themselves like giant springs beside each pod, tendrils as thick as a man's wrist 
The great pods were ranged in a line that extended as far as McGuire could see in the dim light. His shoulders drooped as the guard herded him and his companion toward the building beyond. He must not be cast down. He would not. Who knew how much of such feeling was read by these keen-eyed observers? And the only thought with which he could fill his mind, the one forlorn ghost of a hope that he could cling to, was that of an island, a volcanic peak that rose from dark waters to point upward toward the heights. The guard of four was clustered about. The figures were waiting now in the gathering dark, waiting, while the one in scarlet listened and spoke alternately into a jeweled instrument that hung by a slender chain about his neck. He raised one lean hand to motion the stirring guards to silence, listened again intently into the instrument, then pointed that hand toward the cloud-filled sky while he craned his thin neck to look above him. The men's eyes followed the pointing hand to see only the sullen black of unlit clouds. The last distant aircraft had vanished from the skies. Not a ship was in the air, only the enveloping blanket of high-flung vapor that blocked out all traces of the heavens. And then? The cloud banks high in the skies flashed suddenly to dazzling rolling flame. The ground under their feet was shaken as by a distant earthquake, while above the terrible fire spread, a swift, flashing conflagration that ate up the masses of clouds. "'What in thunder?' McGuire began, then stopped as he caught, in the light from above, the reflection of fierce exultation in the eyes of the Scarlet One. The evil, gloating message of those eyes needed no words to explain its meaning. That this cataclysm was self-made by these beings, McGuire knew, and he knew that in some way it meant menace to him and his. Yet he groped in thought for some definite meaning. No menace could this be to himself personally, for he and Sykes stood there safe in the company of the Consular himself. Then the threat of this flaming blast must be directed toward the earth. The fire vanished, and once more, as Professor Sykes had seen on that night so long ago, the blanket of clouds was broken. McGuire followed the gaze of the scientist, whose keen eyes were probing in these brief moments into the depths of starlit space. There! There! Sykes exclaimed in awestruck tones. His hand was pointing outward through the space where flames had cleared the sky. A star was shining in the heavens with a glory that surpassed all others. It outshone all neighboring stars, and it sent its light down through the vast empty reaches of space, a silent message to two humans, despondent and heartsick, who stared with aching eyes. Lieutenant McGuire did not hear his friend's whispered words. No need to name that distant world. It was Earth. Earth! And it was calling to its own. There was a flying field so plain before his mental eyes, men in khaki and leather, who moved and talked and spoke of familiar things, and the thunder of motors and roaring planes. Some far recess within his deeper self responded strangely. What now of threats and these brute things that threatened? He was one with this picture he had visioned. He was himself. He was a man of that distant world of men. They would show these vile things how men could meet menace or death. His shoulders were back, and unconsciously he stood erect. The scarlet figure was close beside them in the dusk, his voice vibrant with a quality which should have struck fear to his captives' hearts as he ordered them on, but the look in his crafty eyes changed to one of puzzled wonder at the sight of the men. Hands on each other's shoulders, they stood there in the gathering dark, where grotesque trees arched twistingly overhead. Their moment of depression had passed. Earth had called, and they had heard it, each after his own fashion. But to each the call had been one of clear courage. No longer cast off and forlorn, they were one with their own world. "'Down,' said Professor Sykes, with a whimsical smile. "'Down, but not out.' And the lieutenant responded in kind. "'Are we downhearted?' he demanded loudly, and the two turned as one man to grin at the scarlet one as they thundered, "'No!' End of chapter 9